Tony Blair first became Prime Minister 10 years ago this May on a huge wave of public goodwill. I've filmed him throughout his controversial time at the top and watched as he's gone from being the most popular Prime Minister in our history to one of the least. In this three-part series, I'll be looking at why that has happened and at how Tony Blair has responded to the challenges and crises that face a modern Prime Minister and at his complex, multi-layered personality. I think Tony is impressed by wealth, is impressed by uniforms, pretty impressed by intelligence officers, spooks, and impressed by religious people. He was a destiny politician. It was Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Da 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 da! Destiny knocking on the door every day, every hour for Tony. This decade-long dance with destiny had begun at Teesside Airport in the small hours of May the 2nd, 1997. As the scale of Labour's landslide election victory was becoming clear, Blair was flying down to London to claim his kingdom. Okay, Tom, this. <laughs> Along with Blair were Alastair Campbell, his press secretary, and other members of the leader's tight-knit inner group who'd helped create new Labour. We were in this little jet and there was Tony and Sheree there and myself here and I know you're not meant to keep your pager on on the plane but I kept my pager on and it was going every five seconds. <laughs> labour gain, labour gain, labour gain, labour gain, labour hole, labour hole, labour gain. Today. It was just amazing. <laughs> and then I can remember Tony, he sort of just said, what, was, what have we done here? What have we done? What is happening? All you know, these seats were falling places we'd never even campaigned in. In a very curious way, the election night for me passed in a rather strange way, lacking in celebration. I didn't feel this great sense of celebration. I switched in my own mind then to thinking, what am I going to do? What are the things I need to do next? Blair was coming to power as the Tories were swept from office on a tide of sleaze and incompetence the first Labour leader to win a general election for nearly a quarter of a century, cut a reassuring figure for Middle England. Of course, the thing about Tony and his background is he is incredibly posh, so he sometimes doesn't understand people from my background either. Um, I remember I had a chat with him <laughs> when I... Uh, we had a kind of fireside chat as a minister uh, a couple of years ago, and we talked about kids. Um, and I said, oh, you know, I had three kids by the time I was 20. And he said to me, and everybody said to me, oh, he said, so you really are working class. <laughs> I said, well, yeah, Tony, I am. A new dawn has broken, has it not? All these years, we have been people saying, but never given the chance to do. Now we have the chance to make things happen and we shall make this country as proud of us as tonight we are proud of them. Thank you very much, everybody.
So we'd won the election, I'd been up all night like everyone else, who enjoyed the night enormously. And people were saying, oh Claire, and shaking my hand, and people were excited. Um, and I remember this one man who came up and he shook my hand and he wouldn't stop. And he said, Claire, this is wonderful, this is so exciting. If I knew it was like this, I would have voted Labour. So, I mean, you know, the infectious atmosphere went, included people who hadn't even voted Labour. It was remarkable. It's so hard now to recapture the sense of excitement and promise that one gained from first meeting Tony Blair, who did seem a politician of enormous um, character, substance, and understanding that he had a vision of Britain in the 21st century, which was what seemed so lacking from the Tories, and many of us, even on the Tory side, responded with tremendous excitement and warmth to that. Just after dawn, the Blairs went back to their house in Islington for a quick nap. Blair had decided to make his first entrance into Downing Street as Prime Minister on foot, and new Labour spin doctors had carefully choreographed the event with the help of party workers from Millbank. We'd been up virtually all night, and then we were told that um, we could be lining the street to number 10 at 10 o'clock when the Prime Minister would go up the street and into number 10 for the first time. So I joined about 100, 200 party workers. We were given flags to wave. I think people were given flags to, to wave. I'm not sure whether I was waving a flag, <laughs> but uh, flags were waved. It was only the second time in Tony Blair's life that he'd gone into number 10, where the portraits of every previous Prime Minister line the walls. The new Prime Minister had pledged to make Britain a young country again and to make the world a better place. I think Tony believes he had a mission and Prime Ministers that have a sense of understanding that they get one chance to change the culture, the attitude, the well-being of their country and take it will be remembered long after they've gone for having done that and those who don't will be remembered for nothing. Blair planned to run his government with his tight-knit central team. Using the methods that had brought New Labour to power, his chief of staff, Jonathan Powell, said Blair's style would be Napoleonic to the alarm of the civil service. New Labour had been a small revolutionary cell within the Labour Party. It had been a very small core of people that had really led the Labour Party, read, led the New Labour movement. And when they came into government, they very strongly showed those characteristics. Um, it was not uh, a government where everything was thrown open for collegiate debate the leadership of the government reached a view on things and then they, as it were, put those to their colleagues. It was a very strong central leadership right from the beginning. I think Robin felt that he wasn't part of the inner circle and he resented that and he felt that decisions were going on within some sort of revolutionary cell or magic circle as it were from which you know, he, he, he had been excluded. I don't think there was a deliberate attempt to exclude anyone, and certainly not the cabinet uh, secretary, but I think there was a sense that we had come into government with a sense of purpose and mission, that we knew what we wanted to do, uh, and that we had to sort of drive the whole project, you know, politically, uh, amongst those and by those who, you know, really believed in it. Come, come in, go on. Come sit down. Although Blair wanted to be a command prime minister, he knew he wouldn't rule alone. He'd agreed that Gordon Brown, his longtime friend and rival, should have unprecedented power as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Right. This top-level job share extended to a swap of flats between number 10 and number 11, and the volatile Blair-Brown relationship would dominate the next decade. Their first joint venture, the bold decision to hand over control of interest rates to the Bank of England, had been agreed between Blair and Brown in total secrecy. I will not shrink from the tough decisions needed to deliver stability for long-term growth. I have therefore decided to give the Bank of England operational responsibility for setting interest rates. 
with immediate effect. That was a decision that had been taken in opposition. It hadn't been shared with the civil service beforehand. We were only told about it in the first two or three days. And uh, the government wanted to announce it on the Tuesday after the general election. Well, there wouldn't have been time for a meeting of the cabinet by then. Uh, and I said, well, surely this is a big decision, it's an important decision. People were expected to be endorsed by the cabinet. That came, seemed to come as a surprise to, to, to Tony Blair. To Tony Blair, yes. Who, so what did he say? Well, he said, they'll all agree with it. Uh, you know, I don't, we don't need to put this to the cabinet. I knew absolutely nothing about it and I was initially against it on the grounds that I'd just become employment secretary. I was just about to influence the chancellor on interest rates, interest rates down that is, so that we could accelerate employment and growth and suddenly the influence that I was about to have disappeared completely. Tony did tell me about that decision uh, as him and Gordon were involved in making it. It was a surprise to most people and obviously so. It's not something we are considering what you do with the interest rates and the Bank of England but it did make it, it was an important decision. I think that's the kind of decisions you're faced with and you say, oh, heck. given everything we've said about the Bank of England and control, but the both of them were firmly convinced of that. And um, you could say I went along with it and I think circumstances have proven they were right. Whereas the first post-war Labour government had nationalised the Bank of England, New Labour had now effectively privatised it. As for government, well, it beats the hell out of opposition, I can tell you that. They really do say, yes, Prime Minister. Well, not the Cabinet, obviously, but... Although Blair had said, call me Tony, to his Cabinet colleagues at their first meeting, he didn't see the full Cabinet as the best forum for decision-making. He preferred much smaller informal meetings on the number 10 sofa. It was there that I put to Blair what I'd been told, that the two most important words in Whitehall now what Tony wants. It's not that I don't want everything done via me, but I mean, we have a programme, it's my job as Prime Minister to deliver it. Look, I would be pretty shocked if the first time I knew a Cabinet Minister felt strongly about something was if they raised it at the Cabinet table. I would expect them to come and knock on my door and say, look Tony, I've got a problem here, I disagree with this or disagree with that, and that happens from time to time, and people do that, and then you, you sit down and you work it out. But, you know, the old days of, of, of Labour governments where I think the, the meetings occasionally went on for two days and you had a show of hands at the end of it. Well, I mean, I shudder to think what would be happening if we were running it like that. Blair's action man leadership style, which immediately introduced a minimum wage and a flurry of other new laws, seemed to go down well with the public. This euphoria just went on and on and on. The press, you know, they, we've hit the ground running, they said. Uh, uh, I think there are all kinds of satirists like Rory Bremner thinking they were going to be out of work because there's nothing you can do to satirise this government that's so fabulously popular. We suspended our disbelief in a way. It was like watching an actor and you knew it was an act at one level but you actually wanted to believe in it. I first came across Tony Blair in, in France I think in 1996. He'd just been leader for a couple of years. Well, we did have a conversation about uh, the following year and the election and he had obviously enjoyed the stuff we did about John Major and I said, well, next year if you get into power, the boot will be on the other foot and we'll be doing stuff about you. And he said, eh, how does Lord Bremner sound? Which was funny then, but it's a lot funnier now. The Prime Minister, who still loved to play his guitar, turned number 10 into the corporate headquarters of Cool Britannia. You were welcome into Tony Blair's big tent if your face was famous enough. It was, I'm a celebrity, get me into here. But the most famous face of all had not yet come into the big tent, although Tony Blair was working on it. Privately, the Princess and Prime Minister had expressed their admiration for each other. But just four months after Blair had won power, it all came to a sudden end. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. Blair had learned of Princess Diana's death in the middle of the night. His press secretary, Alistair Campbell, had told him that a shocked country would be expecting his reaction that morning and they discussed what he might say. 
We're going, in fact, to Sedgefield, the Prime Minister's constituency, where he is about to make a statement. The people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. The people of Britain, he said, kept faith with Princess Diana. They loved her. She was the people's princess. People forget, almost ten years down the track, just what a national trauma it was for everybody. You'll remember the astonishing floral tributes, because they were this great symbol of beauty in the future, which was the idealised version of uh, Princess Diana, who'd been crushed to death in a rather seedy car crash in Paris. It was a pretty extraordinary time in terms of the British psyche. And one of Tony's great skills is understanding what's in the head of the British people collectively uh, and trying to deal with that. What was called forth from him was this extraordinary emotional empathy of an actor, really, with his audience. I mean, he knew what people wanted to hear. Uh, and whether he wrote the lines or Alistair Campbell wrote the lines, he delivered them um, superbly. And uh, in the modern world, that is the role of a prime minister. Well, I said what I thought. And contrary to what people say, I didn't think about it for great time beforehand. I said what I thought about it. And who'd come up with the, with the phrase, uh, the, the people's princess? I came up with it, but I didn't come up with the phrase, as it were, in that sense. It was what I felt. The country was very upset. You got the palace behaving hopelessly and seeming not to care about her. And you see Tony, the great actor, just caught the mood, found the phrase, said it right. That's our Tony. That's what he's brilliant at. But our Tony was now in for a rude shock. He'd come to power on an anti-sleaze ticket, promising an end to favours by government for rich businessmen who donated to party funds. We do, as a new government, have to be extremely careful that we are pure and pure, that people understand that we will not have any truck with anything that is improper in any shape or form at all. The first big test of Blair's purer than pure claim came on the motor racing circuit. The government unexpectedly exempted Formula One from the ban on tobacco sponsorship of sporting events. It was then revealed that Bernie Eccleston, the tiny but mighty Formula One boss, who was on the number 10 guest list, had made a very large donation to Labour Party funds. Had you had any favours done to you by Labour? Not at all. I wasn't looking for any. Could you tell us how much you gave to Labour Party? I could, but I'm not going to. In fact, it was a million pounds. And as the scandal grew, Number 10 sought desperately to keep Tony Blair out of it. Tonight, for the fourth night in a row, we asked the Labour Party if we could talk to a minister on this issue. As you can see, there is the seat in our Westminster studio, all ready for him or her, but yet again, for the fourth night in a row, it remains untouched by any ministerial bottom. The following night, Number 10 did dispatch a ministerial bottom to sit on the Newsnight chair. I'm sorry I didn't catch you. When you did he make the decision that it was inappropriate for you to be soliciting money from Mr. Eccleston? Uh, when he learned of the fundraising. And when and was that? And, and learned, of when? The fund learned of the fundraising and realised that the fundraising and the discussions, the discussions that were going on were taking place at the same time as, the, as ministers were considering a matter of direct commercial interest. Yeah, but and, when? That was, and that was during October. Mandelson had failed to defuse the growing scandal, so it was time for his boss to take the stage. Ah, Tony, oh, yeah. I'll call you Tony once and then Prime Minister forevermore. Yeah, yeah. Alastair Campbell had advised Blair that he had to go on television himself and get a good kicking from John Humphreys. You could turn this, can you turn that monitor off for me? You've been in power for six months and a bit now, um, and you've had a quite 
extraordinary period in office. I mean, you have been the most popular prime minister ever. Now the papers are saying that the issue surrounding you is one of trust. Do you believe that as a result of what has happened in this past week or so, you have lost the trust of the British people? Uh, no, I don't believe that. Uh, and I hope that people know me well enough and realize the type of person I am to realize that, that I would never do anything either to harm the country or, or anything proper. I never have. I think most people who have dealt with me think I'm a pretty straight sort of guy, and I am. As I watched that interview, I kept being reminded of someone else's confessional TV performance. I couldn't think who it was, and then suddenly it came to me. Early on in the premiership, of course, Princess Diana died, and, and her self-defined role was to be, I think she said, the princess of people's hearts, didn't she? And I think Tony Blair had set out to take on that role and be the prime minister of people's hearts. And so it was only natural that after the Bernie Eccleston thing that he should choose the sort of confessional television interview to say, look, you know, anyone who knows me knows that sort of I'm a pretty straight pretty guy. Pretty straight sort of guy, and I am. But it's a trick you can only really do once. The unfortunate thing is that he did feel obliged to do it and say, I'm a pretty straight kind of guy and I don't get involved in bent things, simply because lots of people will say, well, if he's that straight, why did he come on the television? Why did he feel he had to come on the television to say it? Well, he is a, a straight sort of guy. Uh, he was and he remains. Um, I have known a lot of politicians, and I've worked with a lot of politicians in my life, um, you know, either as a servant of the party or a practicing politician, a member of the government uh, uh, myself. He is a straight sort of guy. The Eccleston affair was the first occasion that Tony Blair's personal integrity had come under attack, although it was not to be the last. And the government's attempts to spin its way out of the Eccleston troubles, using the new Labour techniques that had worked so well in opposition, had also raised worrying doubts in the public mind. To try and show he was more spinned against than spinning, Tony Blair agreed to let us film Alastair Campbell's media operation in action. But on one occasion, when Blair walked into his press secretary's office, he hadn't realized our cameras were there. Is this a... Yeah. Um, it helps me here just have the GPs. But the Tories make no apologies. That is, exactly so that is an accurate description. It is ludicrous. Do you often come to um, your press secretary's office? I do from passing, <laughs> which I happen to be. So how important is, is um, uh, your press secretary to you? Not at all. <laughs> how, what, what? How, how important is uh, Alistair Campbell to you? Of course, I mean, the press secretary is important for the Prime Minister. I mean, it would be odd if, it, if he wasn't, I think. Yeah, but this, this particular... Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I like to think yeah, I've, I've hired the best in the business. I hope I have, anyway. So. Yeah, but everyone says the importance you put on the relations with the media is, is greater than, it, than it's been with any government in the past. I think it's just modern government now. Look, it's a 24-hour-a-day news media. If you don't, if a story comes out that says something and you don't, you haven't got the capacity to get on top of it and say, no, hang on, sorry, the facts are X and Y. And as you probably discovered, I mean, it's not as if, you know, these stories don't, take a life of their own and then start running away into the far distance and then the public thinks, oh my goodness, what on earth are they doing that for when you're not doing it at all? Um, you know, it's important to have the capacity to, to get on top of the, the news as far as it's possible. So when they say, say in the papers who announced the camera spend your whole time thinking about how you're going to win the next election, everything is planned and worked out to be spun in that sort of way. I mean, it's just rubbish. So why do you think the press don't believe this? Are they corrosively cynical? I honestly don't know, and that's for you to to do. But what is important for me is that it doesn't disturb me from doing the things that are really important in the end, which are, you know, the things for the, for the country. Otherwise, there's no point in doing this job. And, you know, people, you know, people can believe that or not as they like, but that's, that's what I spend my time thinking of. So why have you just spent seven minutes talking to Michael Cockle? It 
seemed appropriate to Tony Blair, the destiny politician, that he would be Prime Minister at the coming of the second millennium, and the idea of building a huge millennium dome held great attractions for him. The proposed site in East London was just derelict land when Blair came to power, but he was convinced the dome could be a lasting monument to his time in office. It seems ridiculous now looking back but even then, in the early years of the Blair government, we were talking about legacy issues, legacy items. I can remember a discussion with David Miliband, now in the cabinet, he was then head of uh, the, the policy unit at, at number 10, talking about what, what, what symbols we could have that would be part of Tony Blair's legacy. Um, and one of those was, was the dome. I remember privately, um, off the record, um, urging Blair both before and after the 97 election uh, not have anything to do with the dome, which seemed a hideously misconceived idea. I said, you've got a great opportunity because you're in no way associated with this project, which is entirely a Tory conception. Get out now while the game's good. However easy it would be to say no to this, it would be a real failure of imagination and vision. We're going to take a grip of this, we're going to drive it through, we're going to make sure there's a permanent legacy, we're going to make sure the costings are right, let's stop the carping and all the rest of it and let's get the country behind it we've got to do it and we should do it and it's the right thing to do hello nice to see you blair had turned to his friend peter mandelson certainly yes, been on top of the world now to take charge of the dome project which they hoped would be a bit like the pyramids were for the pharaohs if the Millennium Dome is a success, it will never be forgotten. If it's a failure, we will never be forgiven. It is not going to be torn down. It will be a lasting asset for the country. And I'm sure this really will be the greatest show on earth. He was in that mood when I think he felt he could walk on water and that anything with which he was associated and that he personally anointed was going to work willy-nilly. And I suppose, with hindsight, we can say um, that was an early indication of this um, extravagant faith in his own powers to anoint almost anything and make it happen uh, in a way that we know in reality real life's not like that. Why did it go wrong, the yeah. dome? Um, God, uh, I have no idea why the dome uh, uh, <laughs> didn't go wrong. Um, but it didn't, uh, 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 it didn't go as well as we'd have liked, obviously. But I think that what the Prime Minister was doing, he saw this is a good thing for Britain. But mm. I'll tell you what the Dome told you about Tony Blair. It told you that Tony Blair has the guts to make bold decisions and some of them don't work as well as others. The Dome. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. If I had my time again, I would have listened to those who said governments shouldn't try to run big visitor attractions. The Dome had been a painful lesson for Blair on the gap between rhetoric and reality. Similarly, his attempts to reform the public services like schools and hospitals had, he said publicly, left him bearing the scars on his back. And he was even more candid in the private notes he would write to his number 10 staff. They were quite extraordinary notes sometimes. I mean, a lot of his own frustration about the fact that he wasn't able to um, put into effect all the ideas that he'd had. He was saying, look, I said, Two weeks ago I wanted this done on education. Why hasn't something happened? Why aren't I getting more out of, out of health? Why, isn't, why aren't we getting our message across better on, on, on crime? Number 10 advisers would come over with another bright idea, and to which our answer would be, well, we haven't implemented the last bright idea yet. And that becomes, that becomes a frustration. Everyone sees Tony as a powerful prime minister, and sometimes they call him presidential. But what you notice when you're at number 10, more often than not, is the limits on that power that you can ask departments to do things and they either on some occasions don't do them or they do them very slowly or they do them in a different way or they water them down. And Tony was constantly frustrated. Another major source of frustration for Blair was Gordon Brown. He found the Chancellor very secretive and depended on their meetings to try to prize out Brown's plans. The meetings between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were very important right from the beginning. Now one of the uh, oddities about that was that in the beginning no sore servant, no record taker was admitted to those and this did make it very difficult to operate because 
you uh, couldn't be quite sure what had been decided and the Treasury would get their account of it from Gordon Brown, Ted Downing Street would get their account of it from Tony Blair and um, these accounts didn't always match. So there was, there was some confusion. All Prime Ministers tend to have problems with their Chancellors because it's in the nature of the Treasury to say no, which suited Brown's prudent approach. But when Blair wanted to push Brown into loosening the national purse strings, the battles between numbers 10 and 11 would take on a special intensity. On one occasion, the Prime Minister resorted to using television to outflank his Chancellor. He went on the Frost programme, and without having consulted Brown in advance, Blair announced a dramatic increase in spending on health over the next five years. We will be in a position where our health service spending comes up to the average of the European Union. It's too low at the moment, so we'll bring it up to there. What I was aware of was on the Monday morning when I went into the meetings in Whitehall of the absolute fury uh, of Gordon Brown. I mean, white with anger that policy had been changed uh, in this way. Uh, without any consultation with him, or at least without having reached an agreement with him that that was the way to go forward. He felt as if he'd been bounced into a major change of policy on, on, on public expenditure um, without the proper agreement uh, having been reached uh, in, in, in the normal way. Brown was so angry that those close to him claim that he stormed in to see Blair and shouted, you've stolen my effing budget. When relations between the two men became really bad, the Deputy Prime Minister would invite them to his government flat to try to sort out what were known as the TBGBs. Well, we used to have these dinners and sometimes in the flats in here and we'd talk through the problems. Uh, it was always over a meal, so when people said to me, what, did you, what was your contribution? I said, well, it was a waiter for 10 years, so it was useful having that professional experience in the dinner. I sat there and listened to them, you know, and um, cajoled them and made the point of what I thought the party interests were. Cajoled them? What do you mean? Cajoled them to, to, to agree to, to, to sort oh, out their differences. Yeah, stop the huffing and puffing and find some agreement. But I've always felt that the Prime Minister is a bit frightened of Gordon Brown. Because Gordon Brown is very clever and lives for and loves detail. The Prime Minister is not a details man. And if you're Prime Minister and you're one that wants to bestride Whitehall and Europe and the world like a colossus, if you're a destiny politician, as the Prime Minister most certainly is, to have some clever, irritating bugger across the road who's read all the fine print and tries to withhold information from you and is extremely difficult very often in personal relationships must be immensely infuriating. You go around the world, you get off the plane, you are lauded and magnified and you get home and you think, bloody hell, Gordon again. Northern Ireland was one subject that the Chancellor was happy to leave entirely to the Prime Minister. The troubles were centuries old and had foxed and foiled countless British leaders before Tony Blair, the destiny politician. Tony Blair is going to Northern Ireland today to try to get the peace process moving again. Blair was seeking to broker an historic agreement. His timing was lucky. The two sides felt war-weary, and his predecessor, John Major, had done the spade work. There were a lot of people advising me, I mean gently but firmly, to have nothing to do with it because it was an impossible situation it could never be solved. But I was determined to do it, and I, I knew I had to do it fairly quickly. He thought it was doable, and that was his call. Now. Do you then invest your political capital, your time, your energy, knowing that you're taking a colossal risk because it may uh, uh, fall apart, it may fail, or do you do what you think it is possible to pull off, even though it's going to take an enormous amount of time? Now, if it were doable in his view, he would do it. He wouldn't pass it by. He wouldn't say, this might go wrong, I'm not going to take the risk. That is not in Tony Blair's DNA. In Belfast, Blair and his team, led by his Chief of Staff, Jonathan Powell, devoted themselves to finding an agreement that both sides of the divide could live with, often going over the head of the Northern Ireland Secretary, Mo Molum. I think if I'd been Northern Ireland Secretary, I'd have been a bit 
how can I put this delicately pissed off, <laughs> that um, at every sensitive turn um, in the negotiations, uh, number 10, either the Prime Minister or Jonathan Powell came rowing in, partly because they plainly didn't trust Mo Molum to uh, get on sufficiently well with the unionists and thought that only they had the ability to straddle both camps. Tony Blair did, I think, take risks with the extremists in Northern Ireland, which were probably necessary, but involved, for any democratic politician, eating dirt, um, dealing with um, people like Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness was not fun because they'd done things which one doesn't want to dwell on now. Equally, some on the other side of the fence. In Belfast, Blair would have separate meetings with representatives of the different sides. Trying to find a formula that would reconcile hardline loyalists with hardline Republicans would call on all Blair's negotiating and persuasive skills. People's strengths are their weaknesses. And he's often been criticised for people taking away from conversations what they want to hear. And he certainly is a kind of master of, of, sort of ambiguity. But I think in an Irish context, uh, that worked very much not only to his advantage, but also to the British people's advantage, because um, they could you know, feel his warmth and tenderness, and uh, he, he'd be, they'd be able to take away from the conversation what they wanted. But then ineluctably he'd be leading them towards a position they hadn't thought they were ever going to get to. A day like today, I mean, it's not a day for sort of sound bites, really. Um, we can leave those at home, but I feel, the, I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder. In the words of one spin doctor here this evening, these talks have an equal chance of either concluding successfully or collapsing. There was still apparent deadlock between loyalists and republicans after nearly 12 months of Blair and his Irish opposite number, Bertie Ahern, searching for a deal. But just after midnight on Good Friday, following many more hours of frenzied haggling, a power-sharing executive was finally agreed. I'm pleased to announce that the two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. This agreement was made possible by the leadership, the commitment, and in these last few days, the personal negotiating skill of Prime Minister Tony Blair and the Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern. Tony Blair did, I think, take risks with the extremists in Northern Ireland about um, letting people out of jail. Um, they took risks about um, taking people at their word. Uh, who never kept their word before. And I think, by and large, history will regard uh, the um, boldness he showed on Northern Ireland as probably being one of his main contributions to um, British history. If you'd only done one thing in the last 10 years, uh, and it was Northern Ireland, he'd earned his place in history. Along with the Good Friday Agreement, the Blair government also devolved power from Westminster to Scotland and Wales. And London was now to have its first directly elected mayor. But this presented Blair with a huge political headache in the shape of the left-wing Labour MP and former leader of the Greater London Council, Ken Livingstone. A couple of videos, now I'm going to go in and read all the newspapers. One of those days this symbol of the so-called loony left was anathema to New Labour. Yet Red Ken had surprisingly volunteered to join the Big Ten when Blair came to power. Tony Blair invited me to come and see him. And before the election, I'd gone to him and said, I would like a job in your government. I mean, there are going to be disagreements, but I'd rather play a role inside. And so he, he hadn't given me a job in the initial sort out. But then he invited me on. I now know, of course, that this was at the time he was sounding out Paddy Ashdown with the idea of perhaps bringing Ashdown into the cabinet. So I suspect the idea as he announced Ashdown coming into the cabinet means some minor role. And I said, well, I've balanced it, you know, I've balanced it. Um, but it got off to a bad start because he asked me quite directly, how do you think we're doing? I said, it's very much worse than I expected. And the interview really went downhill from there. 
Tony Blair was absolutely determined that Ken Livingston wasn't going to be the Labour Mayor of London. He didn't want him to be the Labour candidate and he didn't want him to be a Labour Mayor. It would be a disaster for the Labour Party. Don't be under any doubt about that at all. Tony saw Ken Livingstone as a symbol of a return to the 80s. Ken Livingstone, Ken Livingstone, said A, B, C, D, E, F, G, rocking with the GLC. And the bad old days of the 80s and loony Labour councils and all the things that he'd tried to get away from when creating new Labour. And they believe what they read in the press, that we were completely mad. That we, I think they actually must really believe we banned people from having black bin liners and ordering black coffee and so on. I'm um, about to make lesbianism compulsory. All those crude stereotypes, I think they thought there was a fair bit of truth in them. When I was at the Evening Standard, I can recall being hauled into Downing Street twice, I think, to be given an earful by Blair. Um, who demanded why the Evening Standard was not opposing uh, tooth and claw. Uh, Livingston's candidature and uh, I said look Prime Minister I, I didn't want to see um, Ken Livingston as, as mayor any more than you do but the fact remains he's an enormously popular figure and that we have a duty to um, report this election objectively and this didn't go down too well. Although some of Blair's younger advisers tried to convince him that Livingston had changed his spots the Prime Minister insisted the new Labour machine had to find a suitable alternative candidate for mayor. An exotic range of celebrities and politicians were canvassed, including Joanna Lumley, Richard Branson, Glenda Jackson and Mo Molum. But when it all came to nothing, New Labour indulged in high-level political skullduggery to sabotage Livingston's candidacy. And the distinctly old Labour figure of the Health Secretary, Frank Dobson, won Tony Blair's imprimatur. Being endorsed by the Prime Minister is, is an advantage, but I think a lot of people in the party have felt that uh, it hasn't been a fair election. It was not Tony Blair's finest hour. I have a solution for him. Why doesn't he split the job of Mayor for London? The former Health Secretary can run as his day mayor, and the Honourable Member for Brenties can run as his nightmare. <laughs> You do, I mean, do you think that the way Tony Blair and the Wilback Machine tried to prevent your mm. candidature for, for mayor actually played into your hands? Oh, you know, he was your best campaign it manager. guaranteed my election. Livingston easily won the mayoral race as an independent after the wheels had come off the once unstoppable new Labour machine. And when his radical congestion charge was seen as a big success, he was welcomed back into the Labour fold after Tony Blair made a dramatic U-turn. My prediction that he would be a disaster has turned out to be wrong. And I think when that happens in politics, you should just be open about it. It was a very cynical calculation that Ken Livingston was going to win uh, as Mayor of London, he was going to win a second term, uh, that Labour in those elections elsewhere in the country was going to do badly, and we needed a Labour win tick to go on the television screens, and that was, it had better be London. Once again, we had this familiar business that when Tony decides something's all right, it's all right. And he sometimes seemed almost incapable of embarrassment, but most of the rest of us would have been blushing at the roots of our hair over his handling of the whole Livingston affair. And, uh, you know, I always said Ken would make a great mayor. Uh, uh. <laughs> Blair's ability to use a joke to defuse a tricky situation was only one of a wide range of performance skills he brought to the job of Prime Minister. Those who worked closely with him were struck by the contradictory aspects they discovered to his character. Tony Blair is a more complex man than he presents himself as being, and therefore more difficult to understand. He appears as a really easygoing guy, a nice guy to get along with, and that is true, he is. He's in some ways the easiest man to work with you could ask for. But there coexists with that someone who I think is very ambitious, very ruthless, as people uh, some of his colleagues will have found out, and others have found out. Uh, someone who is very uh, conscious of his own ability to charm, who has more charisma, more ability to charm other people, and to leave them walking away feeling tall when they've disagreed, when they've sits, agreed to something they didn't mean to agree to, than anyone else I think perhaps I've ever met in my life. I wrote a column suggesting that Tony Blair was Machiavellian, that he appeared to be very compassionate and devout and friendly. 
and indeed he was, but that when he needed to be the opposite, he could be. And um, word was relayed to me that very day, actually, that uh, the leader had read this uh, article and disagreed strongly, did not feel that he was Machiavellian. But I, I thought that that was part of his Machiavellianism, that uh, <laughs> uh, he can fool even himself that he's not Machiavellian. And people um, don't achieve his degree of success, in my view, uh, without being extremely guileful. And he has managed this trick of appearing to not be uh, a politician, a machine politician, capable of operating the levers of power and patronage, whereas actually um, he's done it very ruthlessly. Uh, in fact, he's one of the most ruthless prime ministers I think we've ever seen. Ruthless. I think if it means determined, then, uh, then uh, I suppose so. I, I'm not, I, I hope I'm not ruthless in the sense that I you know, eliminate everything in my way, just to, you, know, you know, that type of sense of ruthless. But if I am prime minister, I've got to do the job in the way that I think. Well, some people would say ruthless. Um, I would say steely. I would say uh, possessed of a conviction and a self-belief which thankfully stops short of arrogance but which nonetheless makes him very decisive about the direction in which he wants to go or what he needs to do in certain circumstances you know whether it be with an event a policy or an individual you know he can you know he can be very steely I know he can be very steely I've been on the receiving end of his uh, of his steeliness tw what twice Blair, the charming hatchet man, accused the media of treating politics as soap opera. But his life at number 10 would sometimes provide twists in the plot that few scriptwriters would have dared. Like the totally unexpected news, his wife was pregnant. Cherie Blair told me how her husband had reacted. It was, she said, the first time she'd learnt the true meaning of the phrase, his jaw hit the floor. Leo Blair was the first baby born to a serving Prime Minister for 150 years. And as a thoroughly modern father, Blair went off on paternity leave. Madam Speaker, I very much join in the personal congratulations to the Prime Minister and his wife, and I very much welcome him back to the floor of the House of Commons. Yeah. We all know how difficult it must have been, sleepless nights, a lot of noise, a refusal to settle down, and that was just the Chancellor. <laughs> the Women's Institute Conference was the venue for a big speech by Tony Blair on his return from paternity leave. He wanted to relaunch New Labour as the party of family values, and he saw the WI with its tradition of jam and Jerusalem as an appropriate backdrop for his speech. The Women's Institute speech was a dreadful speech. We all knew it was a dreadful speech before he even delivered it. Uh, he'd written it at home. He was, he was looking after Leo, the new young baby. He'd come back with this twaddle that he'd put together as some sort of what he thought was a, a considered and thoughtful speech from the heart and all his speechwriters were looking at it tearing their hair out trying to put it into some sort of shape that could be could, could be delivered the delegates to the wi conference were upset to read in advance a number 10 leak of what blair was going to say over the last few months i've spent a long time trying to work very hard on the national health service <laughs> thank you very much it was the first time, I think, that I'd seen the Prime Minister completely befuddled by what was going on. To try and make sure... <laughs> Minister, speak out of politeness. Thank you very much. Some of the delegates objected to their conference being used as a political platform and walked out in protest. Not us. And there are big challenges ahead but I think with the right spirit and the right shared purpose, we can meet those challenges and succeed. Thank you very much indeed. Prime Minister, thank you for giving us some of your time today to speak to us. It has been a unique experience for us. Good evening. Tony Blair's big speech today to 10,000 members of the Women's Institute turned into a public relations disaster.
What's your reaction when you get those almost universally in both the, the press, television, radio, said it was a disaster for you? Well, it's not that, it's, you, know, you know, when you see something like that coming, you're not, sort of, your first instinct in the morning is not to pick up the morning papers, as it were, but uh, um, I don't, you, if you start letting it dominate or dictate your life, this, I think you stop doing the job of Prime Minister well. That autumn out of the blue, came the biggest test yet of Blair's competence as Prime Minister. It began when a motley group of farmers and lorry drivers blockaded a fuel refinery to protest against rising petrol prices. Tony Blair, we told you back in May that we had troubles in the countryside. Maybe you'll listen now when we get the same effect as what's happening in France. The protesters were using French methods of direct action to stop petrol tankers from leaving the refinery and pressure the government to cut fuel duty. Blair was in Hull with John Prescott. His first instinct was to play down the protests, but his deputy warned him that the blockades were spreading across the country. I was trying to say, you've got to be careful. These guys aren't just threatening, they are organizing. And the one thing that made it so quick and a reaction was it was all done by mobile phones. You know, past disputes take some time to organize. All of a sudden it could be organized overnight because most of these workers were mobile with the lorries, the farmers were involved, they had mobiles and uh, it came very rapidly. I was a bit concerned that we weren't reacting quickly enough. The public was reacting to the blockades by panic buying petrol. The fuel crisis was the biggest crisis that Tony Blair faced and that's because it touched every person in the country people weren't getting their petrol and everyone including everyone at number 10 was queuing up for hours to get petrol around the country they could see that the in effect the, the government was being held to ransom by a few people and it got right to the heart of competence which is what we always feared as Blair learned the crisis was worsening he feared his project for showing that new labor was competent to govern was now in jeopardy and he heard the protesters latest tactic was to dispatch convoys of slow-moving lorries to block major roads. And of course the great spectre that Tony Blair had fought all his political life against was the winter of discontent. And this seemed for our liking far too close a parallel of the government and the country sort of grinding to a halt in a way that hadn't been predicted. Blair returned to a gridlocked Westminster to try to pressure the oil companies to get petrol supplies moving again he decided to make a national broadcast, hoping to change reality by the power of his words. We are taking the approach we are because I believe that whatever the rights or wrongs of the arguments over fuel duty, we cannot accept as a government or as a nation that policy should be dictated by illegal blockades, pickets or direct action. Everything is now in place to get the tankers moving, refueling the empty stations as a priority. We hope within the next 24 hours to have the situation on the way back to normal, though it will take longer than that to be fully back to normal. Well, the Prime Minister was, was saying to us, he said to me, I want to see the tankers coming out the, the refineries by the nine o'clock news. So I said, well, I'll do my best, Prime Minister. Um, and, uh, it was a beautiful sunlit early evening uh, with the, the light streaming into his study. And he was wearing a pair of shorts because I think he'd just come off the exercise bike. So anyway, there was this rather incongruous conversation taking place. But in the refineries, the tankers didn't move. Their drivers refused to break the blockade. What was his reaction when the lorries didn't roll? Oh, frustration. Uh, because it, you, it ought to be possible to make that happen. It ought to be possible from a relatively small control tower, from, a, from this powerful new centre of government, to produce results. Well, I remember Tony Blair saying this could be it. I mean, we could be out of office next week if this continues, because, you know, it just shows us to be completely incompetent. And if we couldn't even get petrol to the pumps, people would turn against us. And if we have to back down, then for us, it would have been curtains. The next day, protesters escalated their campaign and blockaded city centres. Blair, in turn, raised the stakes by warning of the dangers if doctors and nurses were caught up in the action. Lives are at risk if these people 
cannot get to work. We as a country say to the protesters, enough is enough and it's time to, to, to stop this and allow the country to get back to normality. Within less than a week, the protesters had brought the country to its knees and had made their point in the most graphic fashion. With a beleaguered number 10 now making conciliatory noises about cutting fuel duty, the protesters decided to call off their action and the tankers started to roll. But for Tony Blair, it had been a damn close-run thing. It was the fuel driver's dispute that first showed him what it might be like if he lost control. And it was a terrifying experience by it. He was very, very shaken by it. I think everybody else was. The petrol crisis had shown Blair how vulnerable the economy could be to a determined protest group using modern technology. The Tories took a short-lived lead in the polls and Blair presented a penitent face to his party conference. I am listening to people's anger over fuel duties. And after the events of two weeks ago, it's no wonder the government has taken a knock. And it happened on my watch, so I take responsibility. I am listening. I hear and I will act. But I have an irreducible core within me. And it's right that people understand that too. Because, you know, there's no point in leading a Labour Party or, or leading a country without having a mission and a purpose that is more important to you than anything else. So I am listening that I was also elected to lead. Blair's missionary zeal was undimmed. He was still determined to transform Britain into a country that blended social justice with business dynamism. And the following year's general election would be the test of whether the voters would give Tony Blair a second chance. And the public wanted to give us another term, but we had to earn it, and we did. And so they would only not have voted for us for two elections had we um, screwed up the first term. That's one reason. And the second reason, and the key one, is that we did facilitate a strong economy. You know, we did the things that we said we would do. What, what do you think contributed to the size of that majority? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but Labour's second huge election majority had been a somewhat grudging affair. Although most voters were better off than they'd been four years earlier, there'd been a record low turnout at the polls. Tony Blair was returned to number 10, pledging to restore people's faith in politics. But his quest for a lasting place in history was to be suddenly propelled onto a different stage by mass murder in Manhattan. Next week I'll be telling the inside story of Blair's Wars. When he came to power nearly ten years ago, he made a remarkable speech. Mine is the first generation able to contemplate the possibility that we may live our entire lives without going to war or sending our children to war. He's now sent our troops into battle more often than any previous Prime Minister since the Second World War. Having had the experience of doing it once, you can draw on that experience and I think it gives you greater confidence, if you have to, to do it a second or third time. That's the second of our three-part series on 10 Years of Tony Blair, next Tuesday night at 9 o'clock on BBC Two.